Yes, welcome to AI Decoded. It's something we have all probably thought about at some point in our lives. Would we like to live forever? Well, scientists are now increasingly turning to artificial intelligence in the hunt, if not for eternal life, uh, for a drug that could help extend quality of life by slowing down the aging process and staving off the ravages of time, such as frailty and disease. If all of this sounds like science fiction, we have two sisters who beg to differ. Uh, Dr. Karina Kern and uh, Serena Kern Libera featured here in The Times are at the forefront of revolutionary longevity research in Cambridge, where they used AI to discover an anti-aging drug. Now they've attracted the attention and financial and expert backing of billionaire investors, research philanthropists, the UK government and even NASA. And we are very pleased to say that Karina and Serena from the AI health startup Linkgevity are both with us here in the studio. Welcome. And also with us, AI Decoders, Decoded's Priya Lakani, CEO of Century Tech. Uh, it promises to be a very, very interesting conversation. But first, before we get into that fascinating discussion, let's take a quick look at this graphic illustration of how AI was used to help develop the world's first anti-necrotic drug, necrosis, meaning the death of tissues in the body. What if aging isn't a slow, inevitable decay, but a series of programmed demolition switches? Flip the wrong ones and tissues start to fail. An AI-powered startup has built a blueprint of aging to find those switches, and they've found a big one, a messy, chaotic form of cell death called necrosis. This company, Linkgevity, was founded by two sisters who believe aging can be tackled at its source. Their AI doesn't just look at symptoms, it maps the precise molecular pathways that trigger our body's decline. Think of it less like a blurry photo of old age, and more like a detailed schematic of exactly what goes wrong and when. This blueprint reveals the first dominoes that need to be stopped before they all fall. Their first target is that messy process, necrosis. See, most cells die cleanly, but necrosis is like a biological riot. Cells burst open, spilling their contents and causing massive inflammation that damages everything around them. It's a key driver of accelerated aging, especially in critical organs like our kidneys. And until now, it's been a massive, unsolved problem in medicine. So Linkgevity designed a first-of-its-kind drug, an anti-necrotic. Its mission is simple, stop the riot, protect the cells. And it's about to enter its first clinical trial, targeting kidney degeneration. Why the kidney? Because it's a perfect model for accelerated aging. Success there could validate the drug as a treatment for aging itself. Even NASA is interested, exploring its potential to protect astronauts from the rigors of space. This isn't just about one drug or one disease. If you can control necrosis, you can change organ preservation, improve tissue engineering, and fundamentally boost our body's resilience. This isn't about living forever. It's about rewriting the rules of health span, adding more good years to life by disarming the very triggers that take them away. The blueprint is here. The first shot is about to be fired. Well, let's get into the conversation. There's a lot to talk about, isn't there, Priya? So um, Karina, Serena, great to have you with us again. Um, Karina, first of all, of all the things that AI can focus on, and there are many uh, yeah. under investigation right now, why aging? Why this subject? So the key challenge with aging, and if you take a step back and you ask yourself, well, how is it that medicine has been so phenomenal, really, at tackling diseases early in life? such as infectious disease, and what is the difference between age-related diseases from your cancer, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and so on? The answer there is the sheer complexity. Diseases early in life typically have a single underlying cause, be it a single bacteria, virus, pathogen, and so on. Versus later in life, each disease typically has a multitude of different factors giving rise to it, right? This is why there are so many risk factors. But at the same time, multiple different organs are affected simultaneously. And the challenge has been trying to make sense of that sheer complexity and identify interventions that can hit the system as a whole. And, well, when it comes to AI, we know that data is the lifeblood of AI. And I think you've publicly said when it comes to aging that that data is either fragmented, it's not able to be integrated, it's really difficult to collect that data. So what have you developed that is so groundbreaking 
and what sort of data are you using to help you in your research and to take this forward? Right, so to get to the heart of aging, you need to somehow understand the changes you get from a genetic and molecular level down to your cell, down to the tissue, through the whole system, down to your medical changes, right? The changes that your doctor would diagnose and try to treat. Um, and therefore, you need to somehow link all of these different data sets. And the challenge is because they are incomplete, how do you make sense and work with limited data sets? And really where we excel is working with the limited data sets. So tell us then how AI, the AI approach to this, is different from other approaches to trying to look at aging. Right, so typically where AI works incredibly well is where you have good data sets that enable you to make good predictions. If you lack those data sets, what you can use as an alternative is how you structure the AI. And I often use um, the analogy here of playing a game of chess. Imagine if you were to give AI nothing but a chessboard, no prior data and some pawns and expect it to play a game of chess versus fine, you may not have the perfect data sets, but you give it all of the rules of the game. And then it is far more likely to make good predictions and importantly, testable predictions. That's a really, really useful analogy, a really clear one, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And so you've developed what's called the blueprint theory. Can you walk us through that and really explain to us and the audience what that is? And again, why is this different? You've obviously created, you've put the rules of the game in, I suppose. And, and also just explaining like the data, are you using biological signals, are you using imaging data, just go a little bit into that and walk us through, you know, what this blueprint theory looks like. So, so key here is to be able to somehow make sense of all of these different data sets and integrate it. So the answer is we use as much as, you know, you have out there of the medical literature and biological literature. Now, the blueprint itself is very simply taking a systems level solution to a systems level problem. And the approach can be likened to factor modeling in finance. Um, and for those who don't know, very simply, factor modeling is where you say, right, we appreciate the system is complex. There are multiple interacting elements. But what you try and identify are key nodes within the system driving the greatest level of change. And once you identify those key nodes and target it, you're and they, you're able to have the greatest protection across the system as a whole. So basically you're finding the route that has the, the greatest prospect Correct. for success. And uh, I know that you've had, uh, just to jump in on the, the interest that you've had from so many organizations, including NASA, mm -hmm. for example. Tell us about that. They, they clearly think that you're onto something. Well, necrosis is a profound problem on Earth. But it's also a problem in space because in, in space, the body undergoes accelerated aging and accelerated degeneration. And so if you can stop that, then of course, you know, that, that has massive potential for space exploration as well. Um, and that's where the, the kind of space interest has come into the picture as well. Um, but, you know, it, it, it is just important to appreciate just how profound a problem necrosis is. It is really the beginning of the end in many ways. Necrosis means death and um, it, it causes that cascade of degeneration that you see as you get older in particular. Can you explain that a little bit more? Are we talking about um, resilience? Are we talking about cell repair? Are we talking? Can you just explain that a, a little bit more to us so we understand why you've honed in on that particular area? And then I guess how that works with the system of the body, mm. right? Because I think if we were going to expand our lifespans in some way, even in a healthy way, people would then ask about, well, can certain other cells, for example, like your brain cells, keep up with that? Um, so how is this a whole system level repair or, or is it about specific organ damage or resilience? Yeah, so if you think of what biology really is, what is the fundamental building block of biology? It is the cell. And how your cell lives and dies dictates whether your biology is working effectively and functioning effectively or not. Now, broadly, you have two types of cell death. Programmed or genetically programmed beneficial cell death, where evolution has you know, selected certain genes uh, through the course of history because they confer some sort of a benefit. They take out cancers, they promote development, wound healing, and so on. Versus 
cell death arising purely from damage, which is necrosis. And this is what underlies tissue degeneration. And key here is all of the cells in the human body are susceptible to this. It's not just humans, it's across species. This is a biological problem, right? A biological constraint, if you like. Um, and key is for the first time, the potential, if you are to intervene in that, in effect, shield cells, right? Protect them from extreme stresses. Then you are going to have a systemic benefit. And yeah. in, sorry, in your next step, you're going to target the kidney. Why specifically the kidney? I think that's what you're looking at in terms of the first human trials. Well, kidney disease itself is a phenomenal challenge, right? So if you look um, as an example in the US, 24% of Medicare's budget roughly goes on the kidney, on kidney disease. So to put that into perspective, five times the annual budget of NASA. And the numbers are equal in Europe as well. Okay. Um, so yes, kidney disease, ninth leading cause of death is a big problem, but they also show accelerated aging. In other words, if there was an organ you'd want to start with, so you can avoid the decade-long clinical trials to get a drug approved for aging, and that's really our ambition, get this approved yeah. as the first drug that's for aging. That's place, because then yes. if one organ starts to fail, th there can be a domino effect. We are very nearly out of time. A couple of quick fire questions, if I may. When do you hope to start the human trials? We're hoping to start next year, subject to regulatory approval coming through. Okay, and as we said in the introduction, this is not about, you know, the search for eternal life, but uh, you have to assume that if this leads to the logical progression that you hope it does, that life could be extended. Do you have any idea by how long? So I don't think any credible scientist could ever say by how long, but the simple logic is, if you take out the devastating diseases and the degeneration that is limiting both your length of life and the quality of your life, yes, of course, inevitably, mm. you will see an extension of life. But more importantly, you will avoid the spiral of health decline that, you know, really robs you of your human dignity. And very briefly, are you thinking about ethical concerns as you undertake this work as well? Of course. I mean, we are, we, we're taking the drug through regulatory approval. Um, so this is, you know, this is the, the, the regulatory burdens here are very high, to be clear. Um, and of course, when you're talking about human life, you have to take into account ethical considerations. So it's very much at the heart of what we do. We could talk for much longer, but it's been fascinating to speak to you today. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the programme. I know Priya agrees as well. Dr. Karina Kern, Serena Kern-Libera and Priya Lakani. thank you all very much. That is AI Decoded.